We've already seen whether ChatGPT can understand and communicate in Latin. Now let's really put it to the test. Can ChatGPT communicate in ancient Greek? I'm Luke, and this is Polymathy. All right, I'm going to ask it. Naturally, I am going to be using today the Pompeian Lucian pronunciation for more see my audiobook, The Judgment of the Goddesses by Lucian. Okay, first problem. It understands what I'm saying, but it responds in modern Greek. Okay, let's clarify to the machine the problem. I'm going to tell it, you just wrote in modern Greek. And now I'm going to command it. Write in ancient Greek. And here it says very clearly, Den ime ikanos na grafo ina synomilo sin archeia eliniki glossa. I am not able to write or communicate in the ancient Greek language. I don't want to give up yet. Maybe it can do something in ancient Greek. Let's do Attic. So now I'm telling it, translate into Attic. It won't do it, it just wants to do it in the synchrony eliniki glossa, in the modern Greek language. Let me try something else. I'm going to ask it, What did Plato say about virtue? Okay, it keeps going on in modern Greek, so I've just stopped it. What about this? Okay, so it's finally started to kind of sort of generate ancient Greek. We got some smooth breathing. That's a good way to tell ancient Greek from modern Greek, at least in writing. So, toechin te narete, an infinitive. Modern Greek doesn't have infinitives. It's very important to mention, of course, that modern Greek is not the same language as ancient Greek. For whatever reason, Greeks are taught that ancient Greek and modern Greek are the same language. They're as much the same language as Italian and Latin. Now, Italian has a huge amount of Latin vocabulary that's been brought into it. Modern Greek also has a huge amount of ancient Greek vocabulary and expressions that have been brought into it, but to an even greater extent. And there's never been any nationalistic or cultural linguistic decision to really cultivate a difference between the ancient and the modern language really until the 20th century. Very different over in Italy where Dante and other poets started to write in vernacular. And there are similar stories in the other Romance language speaking countries. This is one of the huge ways that modern Greek grammar demonstrates itself to be very much a different language because modern Greek does not have infinitives. And ancient Greek has several types. So there is no equivalent to echin to have in modern Greek. There's only that I may have or that you may have in modern Greek. But the problem, of course, here is that sten arete. It's missing the new of the accusative. That's something that's characteristic of modern Greek. That's an ancient Greek phrase to have the good. The work of virtue. The teaching of virtue. These phrases, except for the new that's missing here, are indeed of the ancient uh, Greek language and the explanations are then follow are in modern Greek. So it looks like ChatGPT is not going to be the way for you to be able to practice the ancient Greek language. But if you do really want to learn ancient Greek, then you're going to want to take courses at the Ancient Language Institute. ALI is bringing ancient language pedagogy into the 21st century, taking advantage of excellent digital tools that introduce you to tons of video and audio in the target language before you even show up to the online classroom. Your instructors at ALI make the most of in-time class, troubleshooting, difficult passages and concepts, guiding you to the conversational ability and reading fluency that you want in ancient Greek, Latin, Biblical, Hebrew, and even Old English. Registration for the autumn term closes August 12th with the beginner level cohorts starting in Latin, ancient Greek, Biblical, Hebrew, and Old English. And if you're interested in Hebrew, the fall term is the only term each year to get started with Biblical Hebrew 101, so make sure you sign up as soon as you can to save your spot. However, if you're not a beginner, but you want to improve your understanding in one of these languages, ALI offers a wide variety of intermediate and advanced classes in Hebrew and Anglo-Saxon and Latin, and of course, Ancient Greek. And speaking of Greek, I don't want to forget to mention that you can join the ALI instructors this summer in Eugene, Oregon for a 10-day Greek language immersion Bible camp. For more information, visit ancientlanguage.com. 
I've been part of the Ancient Language Institute since its inception, and it's been just amazing to see how many people have learned Ancient Greek and Latin and Hebrew and Old English in just the space of a few years. It is such a worthwhile endeavor to learn an ancient language, and I am very proud to promote ALI here on my channel. Let me give it one more chance. I'm going to tell it what you wrote. Write it in Attic. Aha, okay, well this is better. Toechin te narete n toechin te naretein os catastasis e catactesis te saretes. Toechin to calon e aretes os calon. So it's getting there. It's not really great at this. But let's see what else it can do. Maybe it can translate. I'm going to take this bit from the Apologia of Plato from the Perseus website, and I'm going to confront that with the English translation given here. So I wrote, Tade Britannisti Grapsom. Britannisti means in the English language, in the British language. And says, I apologize, but not able to generate a response in Latin. My training primarily focuses on modern English and ancient Greek. Uh, that's not exactly what I said. So let's do this again. Tade Anglisti, the other word for English. Grapson. Okay, now it understands. That you men of Athens have suffered at the hands of my accusers, I am not aware. As for myself, I indeed almost forgot who I was due to their arguments, so persuasively did they speak. So it does fine. This can actually translate from ancient Greek into English. That's something that, say, Google Translate, to my knowledge, has no ability to do. That's because Google Translate only offers Greek. And since ancient Greek and modern Greek are different languages, that's not very helpful. There are, of course, lots of similar cognates. A lot of words can look identical in a lot of situations, often pronounced very differently, of course, in ancient Greek from modern Greek. But that's the exact same situation we have with, say, the Romance languages and Latin. So not very helpful on the Google Translate side, whereas this actually can translate stuff from ancient Greek into modern languages. ChatGBT knows most of the major modern languages pretty well, so it's likely to create a decent version of the text. Let's try something a little different. Can ChatGPT translate adequately from English into ancient Greek? I'm going to have it translate the Gettysburg Address by Abraham Lincoln. Let's see if it can do it. And tau theten pente conta tria kai ogdoe conta proteron hoi patere se mon exe gagon iston topon tuton entos kai non kataskeo asantes en leotheria su labontes kai prosetithentes to logo otipantes hoi anthropoi isoi Ketisthesan. Alunyun hemis en megalo polemo politico esmen. Pirontes i he politia ekine e politiatis toiaute kai toiutos hyperchon dunatai diatelin. This is not bad, just some things that jump right out at me. The toiutos and toiaute, like it's the politia that's always being described here, so this should be the same. At least it's words and grammar that is in ancient Greek. So the trick seems to be to tell it to translate into Attic, uh, which is Attikisti. Attic, of course, is the foundation of all ancient Greek, the equivalent to classical Latin. It stopped, it didn't do the whole thing, but it uh, got pretty far. It's still getting some things wrong, uh, just stuff that leaps right at you right away. The accent just doesn't work here, so what is it doing that's wrong? But this is better. I mean, it did say, I don't do ancient Greek, and I forced it to, and it put out something that is more than halfway there. It's definitely way better than just responding in modern Greek like it was doing before, which I found irritating. What about biblical Greek? That's always easier, right? Well, this is from the PDF that comes with the audiobook of the Gospel of John that I sell on my audiobook store. I'm giving myself a little plug. Thank you for those of you who have already uh, bought this audiobook. Now, let's try something pretty well known. Let's see if it can do in the beginning. So, translate this into Koine Greek. Let's see what it comes up with. And it does it perfectly. En arche en hologos, keologos en proston theon, kai theos en hologos. Wonderful. So it does that perfectly. But of course, that's an extremely well known phrase. Let's go to something a bit more obscure. I'll just pick this at random. 
Uh, let's do this and see what it comes up with. Of course, this is also the King James Bible translation, so it might do weird things. Translate this into English and see what it does. This is the exact same passage, but the original Greek. Obviously, they look pretty different. Having wrote about 25 and 30 stadia, they see Jesus walking on the sea and approaching the boat, and they were afraid. So, of course, the English, this is the King James Bible version, so when they had wrote about 5 and 20 and 30 furlongs, instead of stadia, but of course the Greek is stadia, uh, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh into the ship, and they were afraid. Very close, so the difference between ship and boat of course, the ancient Greek original word here is ploion. So let's compare the two Greeks. Pentekaitika stadius. So we got the stadius is right. And we have pentekaitika equals pente e triakonta. 5 and 20 or 30 furlongs. So equals pente e triakonta. So 25 or 30. And here we have 15. And as ehos hekaton i koston and it has or a, or about 120 so i know this english is a bit archaic and so it may not understand that um so we'll move on they see jesus walking on the on the sea theorosin ton yesun peripatunta epites thalases that's fine theorosin ton yesun peripatunta epites thalases identical kai Engizonta to ploio, gengis tu ploiu gi nomenon, kai efobethesan, and that part's identical. So it's pretty close. Let's try one more thing. Apikrithe autois o Jesus, kai pen, amen, amen, nego hyumin, se ti teme ukhoti idete se mia, alohoti pagete ek to narton, kai echortas theste. Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves and were satisfied. Outstanding. It's possible that it knows the Bible really well, which is great, because this is a very useful text for learning other languages, certainly ancient Greek, this being the Koine dialect of ancient Greek, being a very useful thing to learn and understand when it comes to the study of the ancient language. Well, what about some ancient Greek quotes? Can I translate them from English back to ancient Greek? Here is a bit of Heraclitus. Grapson tade atikisti, it is not possible to step twice in the same river. U depote dunatonesti dis benai isto auto potami. Oops. Ton auton potamon. So the uh, uh, potami, which is modern Greek, is from the diminutive potamion or potamion, a small river, and that is simply the modern Greek word potami, tofto potami. So that's close. I think it gives a good example of what this thing can do. U depote, so never, do not on estin. Now it has the estin, the nu in front of the consonant is not considered good attic style. It is, however, somewhat common to have the new, the um, movable new or FL cystic new, new, generalized everywhere and never being removed. And such words like SD, estin, also third person plurals and dative plurals and so forth. But at least the accent's right. The fact that we have this minor Greek term, potami, instead of potamon, if it had potamon, but ah, so close. So maybe I can teach it. All right, so I said, Helexis potami ukestiatike ala neohellenike. That says in Manu Greek, Signomi, pardon, and it says, Ilexi potami sta archea atiki eliniki onomazotan potamos. Potamu being the genitive form. That being said, will it remember if I just copy and paste this and ask it the same thing? Well, then it says, Udis, the accent is acute, wrong needs to be before a following word if it's final. So, udis dunatai dis to auto potamon vadisai. Yeah, well, it's, uh, well, it's getting there. What about regenerate response? What does that do? So, it kind of gets close, but it's definitely not getting better. The original Heraclitus is more like, this is ton auton potamon ukanembayes. Let's try a bit of Hippocrates. Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. A little archaic with a thy, but I think it should figure it out. 
Okay, so these words are all indeed Attic, range in Greek, but they don't make sense exactly. Artos nosema ginestai, gignestai. Boethetikos kai boethia gignestai, gignestai trophe. So artos is bread, close enough. Nosema is sickness. Gignestai to become boethetikos, helpful. So bread to become helpful, disease, and help to become food. Not really that great. Let's try something a bit more Spartan. Come and take them. This is how we say it in English. Moron labe, the famous Spartan phrase. El tekai labe tauta. Okay. The accent's missing. The accent's wrong enough. Eh? But that's better. Moron labe is... Um, Bolon labe isn't something that one would necessarily easily guess. And there are a lot of ways to say things in ancient Greek. Well, let's try one more thing. Let's take that first line of the Apologia and ask it some questions to define the words, the grammar, something like that, huh? So let's ask it. I'll just ask it in English to help me understand the word peponthate in this phrase. So the word peponthate is the second person plural of the verb pascho in the perfect tense. It is derived from the root verb pascho and indicates a completed action in the past with ongoing effects in the present. In this context, it can be translated as you have suffered or you have experienced. So the phrase peponthate hypoton emon kategoron can be translated as you have suffered at the hands of my accusers or you have experienced the actions of my accusers. That is great. This is probably the best thing you can do with this when it comes to ancient Greek. It will be able to help you understand the grammar. So it's great if it tells you, oh, this is the second person plural of the verb pascho. That's hugely helpful because, as you can see, the root verb pascho is very different from this perfect tense. If you don't know ancient Greek grammar that well, for example, the perfect tense usually doesn't get taught right away. It's not easy necessarily to recognize that this gemination of ba ba, that initial gemination is indicative of the perfect tense in ancient Greek. You might not know that yet, so this could actually be a very helpful tool to understand something like that, understand the pieces. More than that, it goes on to say, this is a completed action in the past with ongoing events in the present. So it helps you understand what the perfect tense is and how it can be used. And then it gives a decent translation. Let me take another piece of the Apologia and ask it to help me understand another one of these words. Help me to understand. Let's pick there. That looks long and complicated, right? Maybe it'll help me in this passage. Let's see what it says about this. I'm going to give it all this context. Maybe that'll help it. It's derived from the root word lego and has the prefix x, which adds the sense of thoroughly and completely. The verb elenco means to refute, to, to convict, or to expose. In the given passage, the word exelenthesontai is used to indicate that the subject, emu, by me, will thoroughly or completely expose or refute the accusers. It is in the future tense, suggesting that this action will happen in the future. The verb is in the passive voice, indicating that the subject will receive the action of being exposed or refuted. So in this context, exelenthesontai can be translated as they will be thoroughly refuted or they will be completely exposed. You get two translations, an excellent grammatical explanation. So as far as a tutor for the ancient Greek language, this can be very helpful. To learn it outright or to have a conversation with a competent speaker, in this case, uh, writer of the language, you're not going to get that. It's going to produce ancient Greek that is subpar at best, if not outright wrong, and mixed with lots of modern Greek. But when it comes to understanding these kinds of details, it's very good at that. And generally, it seems to be pretty good at translating into English. So this is good. So my overall assessment is that ChatGPT for Ancient Greek is interesting. It's about the same as the Latin, except it's harder to get it to start to communicate in the language. I was able to get it to do that a little bit. Atikisti uh, seems to be a key word that's helpful. Maybe if you keep insisting, I simply don't have the patience to fight with this thing, but maybe you do, you can get it to produce more ancient Greek. But then what it produces is inconsistent and often wrong. Often wrong soon. It's a very sloppy rhyme. Wrong soon, wrong soon. This doesn't work. By often wrong, I mean you'll get 80, maybe 90% of the words could be right, but 
it makes mistakes that are just impossible even for you know, first year students to get wrong at the same time. We saw similar problems with the Latin. So it has obviously a high competency in different areas than an extremely low competency in areas that one would expect it to get right consistently. Like accent rules. Accent rules shouldn't be that hard. They're very mathematical, very logical, but it gets those wrong too. So you're not going to be able to have a real conversation with this, probably. I don't know. Maybe the, I, this is just the free version of ChatGPT. Maybe the paid version will bring you more luck if you want to try that out. But my assessment, just like Latin, do not depend on it for good ancient Greek just like you don't depend on it for good Latin. Modern languages seem to be fine. When asked to translate from English into ancient Greek, it came up with stuff that was generally there, but it was often wrong. Often wrong? That is what the colonists called you, isn't it? So automatically, no one's gonna be able to use this if you don't know ancient Greek. It's so interesting. These tools only work if you know the language better than the machine. <laughs> However, if you have a lot of stuff you need to translate, you could have it translated into its ancient Greek, and then you can go and fix it if you have a good eye for detail, and if you know the language well, you should be able to improve it, and it just helps you with some of the work. Or, because the mistakes are very numerous and sometimes subtle, it might create more problems than it's worth. Translating from ancient Greek into English, and I imagine this is true for translating into other modern languages, seems to do quite a bit better. Nothing jumped out at me as particularly mistaken, but I didn't really analyze word for word. I have noticed sometimes, because this isn't the first time I've done ancient Greek with this thing, I've noticed that it'll produce something that is very close and then suddenly wrong because it doesn't understand the context and it does all kinds of weird things. So it's strange. It's a lot like those weird AI photos. Sometimes it will do something that's just weirdly off. Like it'll produce a photorealistic image of a person with an extra finger by mistake. You know, you don't really notice until you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> six fingers, that's wrong. You know, those kinds of things are very odd and weird. So it's just so different from the mistakes that human beings make. So you have to really watch out for them and get used to the device. However, when it comes to asking the machine to help you understand grammar, for example, or the meaning of vocabulary. Like when I asked it those two words, it gave me the root word. And from that root word, for example, like if I didn't know the perfect of Pascho, how could I look up Pascho? Because it looks so different. I was with, you know, Pepa, you know, how am I supposed to figure that out if I'm new at ancient Greek? But then I could go to Pascho and then I could see, oh, look, that's one of the principal parts. And you, you would be able to learn from there. And if you don't know how principal parts work, you could probably ask that too. In fact, let's do that. Tell me about principal parts of verbs in ancient Greek. In ancient Greek, verbs have principal parts that provide the essential forms of the verb. The present indicative, the form represents the verb in the present tense. For example, the verb luo needs to be long on the u as well as the o, sir, meaning I loose. So I have the future indicative, aorist indicative, perfect indicative. The four principal parts are crucial for understanding and conjugating verbs in ancient Greek. By knowing these forms, you can identify the stem of the verb and predict its various inflections from across different tenses, moods, voices, and persons. Additionally, the principal parts help to classify verbs into their respective conjugation classes based on the patterns they exhibit in these forms. Absolutely, except that uh, we're missing the other two. <laughs> well, four is a lot. Four will get you pretty far, but uh, six principal parts are, of course, standard. So, all in all, ChatGPT remains a fascinating, very interesting tool. You cannot rely on it. You can use it, however, to help guide you, especially when it comes to understanding parts of speech. You'll get a lot of help with ancient Greek there. But obviously, if you really want to learn the language, then you should probably consider a course like those at the Ancient Language Institute. Thanks again to them for sponsoring this video and to every single one of my Patreon supporters. Hygienete and walete.